what makes for good programming is having things done uh, so that um, you don't have to repeat code. And I, as a little demonstration, I added a second way to do this calculation, the drop-down. So the same calculation happens up here and over here. So if that code lived as part of the button, then we would have to duplicate the code down here. All right. So what I did is I created a function. And functions are really important to understand. All right. Um, a function, again, is, is a block of code. Um, has a name. Has what are called arguments. Uh, another word for arguments is a parameter. All right. Those are the things that the function is going to use to perform its calculation. All right. Um, I'm saying a function is a calculation. That's one kind of function. There's a, there's a whole mess of functions. There are some functions that don't really do calculations per se, in the sense that they don't do math. But that's one of the easier ones to sort of think about, is that you have a calculation to perform. So the arguments to the function are sort of the ingredients to the process, like the numbers that you're going to do the calculation for. I could have the formula for centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion, Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion, but every time I run it, I'm going to want to do a different conversion probably. All right? So I have to say, well, what temperature do I want to convert? And do I want to convert it Fahrenheit to centigrade? Centigrade to Fahrenheit. All right? And that is the, uh, that is the, the reason that we um, create a function. So we isolate that code. We have arguments to pass to that function so that everything that function needs to do its calculation is in the function or is given to it as an argument. That is an ideal for a function, that everything that the function needs is either contained within the function or gets passed to the function. They talk about this as a black box. A black box, again, is an electrical engineering term where you know what's going in and you know what's coming out, but you don't really need to know what's going on in the middle. So people that use a function shouldn't have to know all the details of the calculation. So when we create an object in a few minutes here for this, when we create a class in a few minutes here for this, we don't have to know anything about this calculation. We just need to know what to supply it and that the answer is going to come out. And that's in engineering, uh, electrical engineering, a black box is where you know what inputs are going in, you know what outputs are coming out, but anyone that uses that black box doesn't need to know the details. All right? Now, notice that nowhere in here do we refer to any of the ASP.NET controls. Remember the earlier version, when the code was here, we looked at the, the, the text box and we looked at the radio button, and, or not radio button, but drop down and so on and so on. Here, we don't look at any of those. That's a key of making the function reusable. That's not tied to the user interface. All right? It's not tied to the user interface. Instead, the way that the function is communicated with is through the function, arguments, and through the return value. So anything this function needs, it's given as an argument. The function does its thing and then returns the results. Because this function now is not tied to the particular user interface elements, we can call it getting the values from a text box and a drop-down, or we could call it getting the values from a drop-down and having a hard-coded value. All right. The second conversion, we're only doing centigrade to Fahrenheit. So we can pick the temperature from the drop-down and go and do the thing that we need to do. So it's not connected at all to the user interface components. Now, this function is, all right, this function has to know 
Well, someone has to connect the function with the user interface, right? And that's going to be these event processors, you could call them, all right? This is going to be this code. Bless you. The user interface uh, itself is, the code is in the ASPX file. That has all the things that are going to be on that page. It's also going to have functions that connect the user interface stuff with our business logic objects, if we have those. In this case, we're considering this a piece of our business logic, even though there's no temperature conversion businesses that I'm aware of. But imagine this being any calculation, being a shipping calculation or something that involves more processing. So there's going to be the events associated with the buttons and the different user interface elements that are going to connect those to the actual logic of our problem. All right? But these event processors aren't going to have tons of code on them. They're going to delegate the actual calculation to the people, uh, I'm personifying this, but to the, to the functions that actually handle that sort of thing. If you do that, you get maintainable code. All right? Now, what if your code goes wrong? What if your code doesn't work? I'm going to go and make a couple of changes to this. And I'm going to turn off the projector for a second. Yes. You don't have to turn back on the light. Okay. I just, don't, I just want to mess this up without showing you what's wrong. Um so that we can go through the process of debugging it. All right. With a couple mouse clicks, I messed up this code. Uh, yeah, it's pretty screwed up. Can we keep it down, please? Sorry. Sorry. Okay, let's see how it is messed up. For one thing, if I put this in, let's put in 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and we do the conversion to Fahrenheit to centigrade. Should be zero, right? Because 32 degrees, the freezing point of, of, of water in Fahrenheit, should be zero in centigrade. Instead, it tells us it is 89.6. Wow. It would have an ice storm today if that was the case, right? Or something, I don't know. Also, if I go and say the freezing point of water here, I don't get any answer. All right? Well, there's, there's, so there's a couple things that are wrong with this. Let's try another conversion. Let's say centigrade to Fahrenheit, and let's say zero degrees centigrade, and that should be 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which it is. So yay. All right? Not, not horrible. All right. So there's two ways that we could go about solving this problem. And the one way every programmer in the world has used some of the time. And that is to simply stare at the code until the answer jumps out at you. All right? Now, you can kind of tell based on that that that's not a necessarily effective tool. You can stare at the code. You know, there's all kinds of things that happen, especially if you've been, if you've been working on a long problem and you've been staring at it. You know, you miss stuff. You have a mental block about stuff. That's why sometimes they say, like, ask a, a friend. You know, this is like, what was that game show? Uh, uh, who wants to be a millionaire or whatever? Ask a friend is one of the options. Sometimes just a fresh set of eyes will help you find it because you've been staring at the code so long that there's something wrong that you're just overlooking. Um, and, and again, it has nothing to do with your skill as a programmer, right? It's just that that, that kind of thing happens. That happens to everyone. And every programmer does that from time to time. They just stare at their code. That isn't always the best way to approach it. Uh, a better way is to employ sort of a systematic approach. 
all right? And that is to, to have a plan and, and figure out um, a systematic way to debug your code. It's like going at the doctor, going to the doctor and, and telling them their symptoms and he just stands there looking at you. And, you know, you, you go and say you're, you, you have, uh, you know, your, your hand hurts. And, and the doctor just stands there staring at your hand. Maybe you got a sprain wrist. I don't know, maybe you do, but maybe it's another problem, right? Much better would be if the doctor took a systematic approach, like ask you questions, like, you know, can you move your fingers? Can you do this? Let's go get an x-ray. Let's go get an MRI. Let's blah, 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 until they can systematically go and figure out exactly what's wrong. Well, the x-ray in programming in the .NET environment is called the debugger, all right? Now, the debugger allows us to see what instructions are being executed. If we run the code this way, by just running it, we see the results of the code, but we don't see what statements actually got executed. Likewise, if I go here and click that, I see the results, which are none, all right? but I don't see exactly how it came up with that result. The debugger allows us to do this. I'm going to try to solve this one first, the, the, the drop-down problem, because that's giving me no results at all. What I can do is this. I can go in the code, and I can mark along the margin the code that is, that is, uh, that is going to be executed. So when I change the drop-down, this is the code that's going to be executed. So I put a, a click in there, in this little gray area here, and there's a red little dot there. That's what's called a breakpoint. When the program hits that part of the code, it's actually going to show you the code, and you can trace through to see what gets executed. All right? So... That's like an x-ray, right? We're not just looking at the results, or we're not just staring at the code. We're seeing exactly the path the program is taking. So let's run this. So I go here, click that. Wait a minute, I thought I said the code was supposed to pop up. The code doesn't pop up. That's weird. What does that mean? The code is supposed to pop Well, let's, let's apply a little bit of simple logic. The code is supposed to pop up when this instruction is hit. The code didn't pop up. Therefore, it never, got to that. it never hit that instruction. It never did. All right. So that's one of the first rules I'm going to tell you about debugging. You have code that doesn't work. Make sure it's hitting that code. It might not be hitting the code that you think it is. It might be hitting different code or no code at all. So, in this case, when I go and run it, it never makes it to this drop-down selected index changed. All right? What do you think would be causing that? What would cause it not to to hit this code. Could be mislabeled, like the drop down list to that part might be mislabeled? That would be one possibility. Alright. I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're saying, but I think it's it's what you mean. If the code and the ASPX file didn't say when this drop down changes call that function. If this little thing was changing, if this little thing was missing, then it would have that symptom. In other words, if the on selected index changed, if there was nothing in the drop down that said call that code when this drop down changes, then that code would never execute. That's why, by the way, it's important to be able to at least whether you use the visual interface or not, it's important to read this code.
because you can't see this easily through the user interface. There might be some way to do it, but it's so much easier to see it through the code. What would be another possibility of why that code is never executed? What kind of code is that? Is that client code or server-side code? It's server-side code. So, when does server-side code get executed? When it receives a request from a client. When it receives a request from a client. When the server is called. All right? So, another way to say this is it might not be running because the server hasn't been called. We have not made a request to the server to do something. Because this is server-side code. It's only going to run when the server has been called, when a request has made, been made to the server. What would determine if a request was made to the server or not? How do we make a request to the server? Exactly. The auto post back property. All right. We can make a request here a couple different ways. All right. In this example, in the in the top part of it, we make a request when they click when they click the submit button. All right. So that part was was kind of working. Right. At least it was getting some results. So we're calling the server when we click the button. All right. In this case, though, we're not calling the server. Well, we don't have a button. So it's not a problem with the button. What must the problem be? Either that button, or I'm sorry, either that dropdown isn't wired to that event, which that's what we looked at before, the code, or we're not calling the server when this changes. And that's the enable auto post back. So we make that change. And stop debugging and start again. Oh. Uh, now, notice it stopped execution. My code was here. All right. Let's do that again. Right. Okay. Let's see what this, what this does. I start debugging. It displays my page. I go and I make a selection. Notice what happened. Now, this time it popped into my code. So now it's making of that code. So that probably was the problem. All right? So, I'm going to assume mission accomplished here, maybe. Um, we'll go back and we'll debug the rest of it later. So I'm going to go and get rid of that. And I'm going to say continue. And it tells me the freezing point of water is 32. Okay. I got rid of the breakpoint. So now when I run this, it doesn't go back and display it. How did I get rid of the breakpoint? Just by clicking on that again. All right. So we still have another problem now. If I go and enter a value here, looks like the centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion is working. But it doesn't look like the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion is working. No. All right, so that gives me a wrong number. So what am I going to do? Stare at the code? Well, you already know that's the wrong answer. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put another breakpoint in. Now I'm concerned what happens when I click the button, right? So I'm going to put my breakpoint. I could put my breakpoint a couple different places. I could put my breakpoint here. I could put my breakpoint here. I could put it in the button click event, or I could put it in the convert temperature function. Where do you think I'm going to put it? In the button click event or the convert temperature function? Convert temperature. No. Just be, no. Uh, I'm going to put in a button click event. Why am I putting in the button click event instead of the convert temperature?
temperature function. I'll tell you what, you're right, the air is in the convert temperature function, but that's not where I'm going to put my breakpoint. Because I don't know where the air is yet. All right? I, I do, but I don't. All right? So <laughs> pretending that I don't know where the air is, I'm going to put that breakpoint right when, right when the, the, the initiation of that calculation occurs. So what initiates that calculation? Well, clicking a button. So chances are there's probably not any problem with this code, but there could be, right? And I'm just missing it. The error probably is in here, all right? Uh, but I don't know that right now. And that is, that's an important point. Um, I've had students, and I myself have said, I know the problem is in that function. I know the problem is in that function. Guess what? Your program isn't working. So what you know might not be the most reliable instrument to talk about, right? You have a bug in your program. It's not working. You can't guarantee you know exactly what that problem is. Now, you might have a good idea, and you might even be right. But until you know for sure, don't make any assumptions. I've had so many people, and I myself have been convinced that there's a problem in one part of the code, and I've stared at that part of the code, and I've done this, and I've done that. When eventually you figure it out, the error could be somewhere else that you didn't think of. And when you do, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense now, right? So therefore, don't assume anything. So I'm putting my breakpoint right as soon as they click the button so that I can see what happens from the instant they click the button to see exactly where stuff goes wrong. All right? So, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like uh, when you lose your keys, right? Um, I've helped people try to find their keys. And I'll say, like, are they in the bathroom? And they'll say, no, they're, they're not in the bathroom. Well, if you don't know where your keys are, how do you know they're not in the bathroom? Right? <laughs> I mean, it sounds dumb, but I'm being serious, right? Don't be so sure you know where they're not if you don't know where they are. So, <laughs> so the same thing kind of with program. Don't be so sure you know where the air is when you don't, you're not getting the results that you want. So I'm going to put the break point here. So I'm going to run this. And I'm going to put in a temperature to convert. Fahrenheit to centigrade. I click convert. What's going to happen when I click convert? Debugger? Yeah, it's going to go into the debugger. It's going to show me right here the line that's being executed. Coded, uh, coded. The little arrow over here, little yellow or gold arrow, points to the line of code. And it and it points the line of code like before it gets executed. All right? And it even shows you the value of some of the variables. Answer is a double and it's equal to zero. It shows you that down here. You have an immediate window where you can put in commands and you can see the answer. So I could, for example, put question mark answer. And that says display the value of answer. All right. It's amazing. That command is identical to the debugger that I used like in basic like 100 years ago. It's amazing that they carried that through, through all their iterations uh, of that. At any rate, so I made it to that part. What do I want to do now? I want to follow the trace of the program. I want to follow the instructions that are going to get executed. So, you have three choices. Step into, step over, or step out. Generally speaking, when you're debugging, you want to do step into. It's being called, and if it's one of your functions, it shows you the code inside of your function. If you say step over, it will go and execute the function, but not show you the trace through that function. 
which is usually not what you want to do, at least not at first. If you truly have done some debugging and you know that there's no problem in a function, you can step over the function and it will execute it and do its thing, with, and, but it won't show you every step of the process. So I'm going to say step into. So now the line is on this line of code. All right. I can, in my immediate window if I want, I can do things like question mark, text box one, dot text. And it will show me that there is a 32 in the text box. All right. Now, I could say step over, and what that would do is that would call this function, but not show me the trace through the function. That's not what I want to do. All right. If I did that, it would skip over that function and just put me here, and I wouldn't see exactly what was going on in that function. I could say step out, which would mean to finish a function and step out of that function. Again, most of the time you're going to say step into. So I step into, it goes now into this function. I'm now in that function. And notice it shows me all these things. What's the arg temp? Arg temp is 32. Is that correct? Does that match what I typed in the text box? Yes. So it's getting the argument right. Arg type, FC. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm doing a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. So I come along here and I say step into is looking at this if statement. It's going to evaluate if this if statement is true or false. Should it be true? Yes, I'm doing a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. It should be true. Is it true? No. No. Uh-oh. If this was alias, it'd be dramatic music playing. All right? It's supposed to be, I thought it was a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. It should be doing this formula. Instead, it jumped to the else, and it is doing this formula. Does anyone see what's wrong? Yeah, do it the lowercase c and the fc. It has to do with the lowercase c and the fc. My if statement says if R type, and there's another cool thing you can do. You can hover over that, and it will say R type equals FC. Notice it's a capital F and a capital C. If R type equals FC, with F being uppercase and C being lowercase, then do that first formula. Well, it's not equal to that, right? We saw that it's not equal to that. We don't have to guess, all right? It showed us that it's jumped to the second formula. Therefore, we know that it should be doing the first formula, so we know that if statement is typed in incorrectly. There's something wrong with it. And again, you're absolutely right. It should be an uppercase, not a lowercase, so we can go and fix it. Now I can say step out. Because I think I know the answer, so I can sort of finish debugging. It steps out of that function. I can step out of that function, and then it shows me the wrong result. So now I can go and, drum roll please, I can correct, thank you. I can say FC, I can correct it. And I'm going to keep the debugging in. For this step, just to illustrate, I go and run this. I type in 32 Fahrenheit to centigrade. I'm going to step into, step into, now notice it, FC, FC, step into, Hits that if statement, step into, 
and yay, it is doing the right formula. So it's going to return the correct value for result. I can click continue, and again, it shows me the right result. And I can get rid of the, the, the debugging code, the, the breakpoint. I can almost guarantee you that if you come up to me with a problem similar to this and ask me what's wrong with it, I will almost always say what happened when you ran it through debugger. All right? Because it's important that you at least try this out, yes. Yeah. You know? The problems you experience might be more difficult than this, right? So um, I'm not saying that this debugger is going to automatically give you the answer to everything that you're interested in. still takes some skill to figure out how to debug it, and a lot of things can go wrong, and, and so on and so forth. But at least try the debugger if you're running into problems, especially if it's problems relating to, well, if it's, if it's problems relating to the C-sharp code, then at least try the debugger. All right. How many of you have used a debugger before? All right. Oh, not too many. Uh, as they say, it is your friend. So become familiar with it, use it. Um, and, and it's a good way, again, it's a good way to systematically figure out your problems as opposed to just staring at the code. Questions about that? All right. On to our next step. Let's say we had another page that wanted to do the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. All right? Again, Fahrenheit to centigrade was picked just because it's a real simple formula. Could be any sort of calculation. It could be our organization's shipping calculation. You know, we're Amazon and we have 56 different shipping varieties to do, and some of them depend if you're an Amazon Plus person, and some of them depend on this, that, and the other. All kinds of complicated stuff in there. So let's say we have some complicated calculation that we want to do on a couple different pages. So let's say I want to create a brand new page called Convert To. So I'm going to create a new page. And I'm going to call it Convert To. And this page is real straightforward. I'm going to copy the CSS code. Because remember, we still want to make reasonably polished, finished looking pages. And this page simply has a text box. and centigrade, so I'll put another label up here. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could show us how to move those around so they can be positioned differently, because sometimes then if they pop up really weird when I'm adding the controls. Yes. I could do that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Uh, let, let me just give the name of this. Um, this should be enter centigrade. This I'm going to change the name of it to text box tamp. This I'm going to change the value to convert. And this I'm going to 
change the value to label results. Now, where does it put stuff? Keep in mind the reason it dropped it down there is because there's not enough space now to show that. All right. If I have something I'm going to drag on the page, I can approximately put it where I want it simply by dragging it and dropping it to the place. So if I wanted a label between the text box and the, or I want a validation control, let's say, between the text box and the convert button, I could go and I could drag this right there. And you see the cursor. So I could put it there if I wanted to. If I drop it, boom, there it goes. What if I want to rearrange it, though? Well, I could rearrange it there. I could put it there. I could put it there. However, what if I want to put it, like, a few lines below? Right. Well, if I want to put this, let's say, underneath the text box, that would be a reasonable place to do that. Not alongside it, underneath. Well, it kind of did, but it put it like in, not really exactly underneath. It put it like down there. All right. For this reason, I never reposition things that way. All right? I never drag them around. It'll drive you crazy. All right? um, how do you, because, how are things positioned on a web page? Things are positioned on a web page based on two different things. One is the browser's defaults. All right? So if I have a, a head, you know, if I have a heading and a paragraph, then a paragraph, then an image, then another image, then blah blah blah, the browser has certain defaults on how to display those things, and it will display them. The second component that comes into play is your CSS. So the browser will position things based on your CSS. All right. So. I would rather take the approach to position it with my CSS. So I wouldn't worry about getting the exact position of it right. I would put it, uh, position it based on my CSS. So let, let's look at it for instance. All right. Uh, if I had to do this, and let's say I wanted the validation control right underneath it, I'd have to go back to CSS, uh, to, to CSS 101 and, and, and remember that, because there's a couple things. It's not going to be hard, but it's not necessarily going to be real easy either. All right? I would go to code view to do this. The code view shows you the basic order that these things are in. All right? Code view shows you the basic order that these are in. And in CSS, the quote basic order that they're in is called the flow. Alright? If you don't position things, the basic order, the default of the browser will be the flow, where it will put inline items one after another, block items that will stock, stack like blocks. So all these things are inline items. So it will position them one on top of the other. Oh, I'm sorry, side by side. They're not block items. So that's how it did it by default. So I want to change that. How do I want to change that? I want to put this underneath this. All right? I could do this a couple different ways. All right? One thing I'm going to do is this. And again, you could do this a variety of different ways. Notice even as I was dragging around, it started creating divs and stuff. 
Oh, that's bad news. That's why I don't drag it around. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to say, I'm going to make a label tag for this guy. Actually, we're going to we're going to go way back. Forms are really lists, so I'll make this an unordered list. Make each one of these a list item. a label tag, but you might say it's already an it's already a label tag. It's not. It's an ASP.NET label control that translates into HTML. Guess what? It doesn't translate to an HTML label tag. It translates to an HTML span tag, which is unfortunate. But I could correct that by saying label for I can put the ID, that's going to be text box temp. This is something we do for accessibility. So that this, temp, this label is now associated with with that text box. to put that validator underneath, I can do this. So now it's kind of underneath that. What I can do is I can give widths to those labels in my CSS. <laughs> Excuse me. So I can give a label. Rid of the uh, 
the bullet points. I realized 20 minutes later that I didn't answer your question. All right? <laughs> but in a way I did. In a way I did. Right? You asked how do you reposition by dragging around? Um, what really was my answer to that question? Don't do it. Don't. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. yeah do it. Don't. Do it for just rough. Like, I want it in these, this kind of order, but then use CSS to refine it and to get it exactly where you want to be. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile. I think it's a review. I, I think it's a way to show you that, you know, your CSS skills that you learned um, are still relevant. Even though this isn't exactly the way I want it to be, but hey, um, no, this is why. There we go. Yes, it is the way I want it to be. So now those two things are aligned. Excuse me. All right. Now, under the bigger question, <laughs> I don't know why we came here today to do that calculation. Well, all right, I double click this. Guess what? I'm going to have to duplicate that code. Well, I already have that code on this page. I could just copy and paste that function on there. No, don't do that. Why not? Well, again, think of a calculation different than uh, uh, the temperature conversion. Think of a shipping calculation. What if that changed? I now have that code in two places. All right. What if there was a bug in my Fahrenheit to centigrade? Like I, I use minus 31 instead of 32. I now have propagated that bug in two places. If I have to correct it, I have to correct it in both places. If you do that often enough, if it's a function that's used in a lot of different places and you have many duplicates of that function, then you're going to have to correct it in every place. Or if it's a function that is going to change over time, like the shipping calculation or whatever, you're going to have to track it down and change it every time that calculation changes. So we want to put this somewhere where we can call it from anywhere. Right now, what we did over here was a good start. We made it so we could call that function from two different places on the same page. Well, that's a good step in the right direction, but the last final step we want to do is we want to go and, and put this code so that we could call it from 
multiple places, multiple different pages. So we're going to do this. I'm going to copy, actually I'm going to cut this out of here. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say File, New, File, and I'm going to create a class. I can give the class a name, and I'm going to call this Conversion, because this class is going to have all my conversions in it. All my conversions from metric to, to English and, and from Fahrenheit to centigrade and Kelvin and all those things are going to live in this class. So it's going to be my one-stop shop for anything about conversions of units. All right? I'm going to give it a meaningful name. I'm not going to call it class one because if you have a, a larger application, you're going to be like, well, what was class 792? All right? I don't remember. So I'm going to give it a meaningful name. It's going, to, it's going to complain about where I'm putting it, and that's fine. It's going to uh, just go along with its suggestion and put it in the app code folder. So answer yes. Here is my conversion function or conversion class. I'm going to put inside the conversion class, I'm going to paste my function. All right. Now, um, how much do you talk about objects and classes in the intro class to C sharp? A lot? A little bit? Like almost not at all. Like almost not at all. Okay. Yeah. An object. Well, well, uh, you will if you take if you take the Java class or if you take the uh, advanced C sharp class. We'll talk a lot about objects and classes. I do want to introduce this to you. Uh, simply put, a class is some place where you can put code that you want to be shared in a whole bunch of places. All right? Um, and I'm going to put everything about this particular aspect of my problem. So I would put all my conversions in here. I wouldn't have any conversions living any place else other than this particular class. Uh, a better example of a class than this might be, for example, there would be a student class on campus, all right, uh, within a campus system. Uh, a student class would contain all the information about a student, you know, the name, uh, phone number, um, and so on. Plus, it would have different calculations associated with the student. How much is your tuition? How much, uh, what's your grade point average? Uh, how many credit hours do you have? All those things would be calculated. So everything about a student would be in that class. And all the calculations, all the methods, all the things that can be done with a student in the system would be in that class. You then create an object. And an object is a member of the class. So the student would be the class. And that represents sort of all students or generic students. A class would, or an object that would be one specific student, all right, and it would be their particular information and so on. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting a class, uh, creating a class, and I'm putting all my code relating to conversions in this class so I can access it from anywhere. I then can go into here now that I've created the class. I can go into here. And I can change both places to use this. How do I do that? I say something like this. Conversion C conversion.
second to figure it out. Now, in a nutshell, what I'm doing by these two lines of code, by these two changes, I'm saying that I'm going to use my conversion class. I'm going to create a conversion object called C. And now I'm telling it where that convert temperature lives. That convert temperature is no longer on this page, but the convert temperature is in this conversion object, which I defined and I put the convert temperature in there. So now, to put it on the other page is trivial. I just do this. page I'm doing from centigrade to Fahrenheit. So I'll put C to F. And this should work. So enter centigrade, zero, convert, 32. All right. Now, everything about this conversion calculation lives in one place. I could write a page that had a chart that had centigrade and Fahrenheit next side by side, and it would just be using this function. If there's a problem in this calculation, there's only one place to fix it. If I was smart, I would document this, and I would say, hey, this is my, this is my conversion object. If you're using, doing any sort of unit conversion, use it. Here are the list of functions in it. This one's convert temperature. It takes two arguments. The first argument is the uh, temperature you want to convert. The second one is the conversion that you want to do. And I have C to F for centigrade to Fahrenheit, F to C for Fahrenheit to centigrade. FC to Fahrenheit to centigrade. All right? And I could publish that, then anyone that wanted to use that could use it. They won't have to know anything about those calculations. They just need to know the object and the proper methods to call. Um, let's see, um, what else did I got to say? Yes? I was kind of puzzled, like, how would you use a randomizer with this together? Like, we'll go over that in the next example. Okay. All right? I'll introduce the next example, and we'll talk more about it on uh, Thursday. Let me think. If there was anything else I wanted to say, wrap up with this. Oh, you might say to yourself, well, this is kind of duplicated code, right? Because this looks similar to the code on this page. Yeah, but there's not much code here. And there's going to always have to be code that links your user interface to your business lo uh, logic. This is just sort of the glue. This isn't really any code of any significance. So the code that lives in those event handlers should be pretty simple. And so the fact that you have to have that on every page well, of course you have to have on every page. You have to be able to go and, and connect this to that. And this is a code that does that. But there's no actual, like, business logic executed in that event code. All right, randomization. Good question. Uh, let me go and save this one. And let me pull down... this. This is a simple dice game. Let's open it up.
and see what it does. This game is called High Low. You roll two dice, all right? Um, and you bet on it being one of three possibilities. Low is the numbers two through six. So if you bet low, you're betting two through six. If you bet high, you're bet betting eight through 12. If you bet seven, you're betting on it being exactly seven, all right? Now the payoffs are different. If you, you get paid off one to one, if you pick low or high, you get paid off four to one if you pick seven. So let's pick low, two to six. I roll the dice, I won, yay. All right, because I picked two to six and it rolled a two. Let's pick seven. I lost because it was eight, so close. Let's pick seven again. Lost. Seven again. I won. Yay. So that's how the game works. So this game is similar to rock, paper, and scissors in that it's going to have uh, randomization. All right? Let's take a look at this code and, and see how it works. All right? Yes. I have a couple versions of this. I don't remember exactly what's in each, each version. The example I'm going over today is the first version um, that's listed uh, in Canvas. So I have a page called Default, and that page contains a drop-down, a button, a validation, a label that says if I've won or not, and two image controls. I have a die class. A die class is a, uh, for one of a pair of dice, a die. When I click the button, I create my two dice. I roll my two dice and get the number that it rolls. I tally it up. I assume that I lost until I, unless I figured out that I won. I grab the value from the drop-down, and I do some comparison. If I pick low, and the value was less than 7, then I won. If I pick 7, and the value equals to 7, I won. If I picked greater than 7, or high, and it was greater than 7, I won. If I won, Say you won, otherwise say you lost. I then get the image name for each dice. And then I display the panel that shows the results. All right. I put on this one the, um, the dice and whether they won or not and all that is in the panel. So. The logic here is pretty straightforward, um, but I have some code in the dice class. So let's look at the dice class. The dice class has a couple things in it. It has a roll method, and this is the random one. Then I get the image name, which is partly hard-coded and partly the value of the dice. I have in my image folder D1 through D6 PNG. So image folder D, and then I concatenate the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 dot PNG into it. Here's the random command. The random command, in this case I say random next 1 comma 7. That's a little goofy to say 1 comma 7, right? How many values are there possible for a dice? There's 6. So that 7 is uh, not inclusive. 
So it will generate a number from 1 through 6 in a nutshell. Actually, it will generate a number from 1 to 6.9999999, but because this is stored as an integer, uh, effectively it's a number 1 through 6. So that's the two methods I have here, to roll and to get the image associated with this. So to answer your question, how do I do a random? It would be like this. Take a look at this example. We'll go over it more uh, in class next time. All right, We're, we are out of time for today. See, and this is the cliffhanger. All right, <laughs> so we come around full circle. So uh, we'll see you in lab. We'll talk more about this on Thursday.